Ask any motorcyclist why they ride and the answers will be vague to an average person who never rode a motorcycle. But invariably there will be some type of emotion involved, thrill, freedom, nostalgia. Enter the era of new retro motorcycles. Modern motorcycles dressed up for a retro party for the millennials. Triumph has been quite invested in nostalgia. Case in point, the Bonnevilles, the Speed Twins, the Scramblers and many more. With the Trident 660, they decided to check two more boxes. Lightweight, right price. Sales went through the roof and now they can't keep up with the demand. Last month, Kawasaki decided to respond with the C650 RS and join the middleweight retro bandwagon. The consumer response? Well, time will tell when delivery begins in 2022. But so far, lukewarm is how I see it. Yamaha had a hoot of an engine people raved about in the FZ07, later called the MT07. In 2016, they created a retro avatar around the 270 degree parallel twin CP2 engine and called it the XSR700. I test rode one in 2019 and remember it like it was yesterday. Regret is the emotion it evokes every time I think about my failed attempt to negotiate the OTD price with that dealer. The Honda CB650R, however, brings a smile because it reminds me of my CBR650F that I rode over 20,000 kilometers in India before I sold it and moved to the US. The CB650R is an interesting neo-retro rendition of that platform, but Honda's struggle with pricing remain unchanged. Royal Enfield has always been about emotion with little regard for technology or modern times. I felt that they failed the legacy of the oldest motorcycle brand in the world by not keeping up with the times, until I rode an Interceptor 650 Twin. My sport bike loving friend actually bought one and I bought the idea that Royal Enfield could indeed change for the better. If you have watched my comparison videos before and are wondering why haven't I started comparing the specs yet, hang tight, I will. But I realize that these bikes are going to be more about the heart than the head. And that is what I intend to help you do. Convince your head that your heart is right. So I'm not comparing looks in this video because you already know which one pulls you towards it. For me personally, it is the XSR700. For you, even if it's not nostalgia, you may just like it because it simply looks cooler than a street naked and more practical than a super sport. The exhaust notes, however, I can't resist but compare. Grab a pair of headphones and listen in.
All these exhaust notes are pretty cool in their respective ways, though I'm yet to come across someone who loves the Kawasaki 650 exhaust note. But then, that's not the be all and end all of any motorcycle. These engines are rather different from each other, but I chose to compare these five motorcycles because of their similar engine sizes. Although I admit that there are a few more retro bikes that make similar power and could have been included in this comparison, how about I keep that easter egg for the end of the video. The Yamaha XSR700 has a 270 degree parallel twin CP2 engine that makes the highest torque among the five and the highest power among the twins. The Kawasaki is the next one on power and torque and the Royal Enfield is the last one on that parameter. Although it is strange that when I rode it last winter, how it accelerated belied the power and torque figures on paper, I could not believe that after having ridden a ZXXR on American tracks for two years, a Royal Enfield could impress me. But it did. The Triumph Trident 660 is the only triple cylinder engine in this comparison and pushes 8 more horses than the XSR700. The engine is definitely smoother than the twins, but Honda is hard to beat on that front. In fact, being too smooth is the criticism some reviewers have for the Honda. At 94 horsepower, it's the most powerful motorcycle in this comparison and beats more expensive and premium motorcycles with bigger engines that get honorable mentions later in this comparison. A twist of the CB650R throttle reminds you that it's on the upper edge of the middleweight class. Though in UK and Australia, all these bikes are accessible to new riders and have A2 and LAMS approved restricted versions available. In the US and India, such restrictions don't exist. Which brings me to how fast can you hurl yourselves towards afterlife. The Honda is the fastest at claimed 140 miles per hour, that's 226 kilometers per hour. I've tested the CBR650F to that claim and lived to upload a GoPro video as proof that I make my guardian angel work sometimes. The Trident is the next one with a claimed 135 miles per hour, Kawasaki is a close third, and the Yamaha top speed claim on the internet seems rather modest. Interceptor 650 is in the last part, but I don't believe that one needs more than 100 miles per hour on any street anyway because what if the guardian angel decides to take a nap that day? Except the Honda, all top speed claims are based on internet sources that appear to be the least dodgy. Though I wouldn't be surprised if there's evidence that these bikes are capable of exceeding those claims. What some of them do exceed is the seat height for vertically challenged riders like myself. At 5'8", I was using all of my 13 years of riding experience to avoid tipping over the XSR700 when bringing it to a stop. On the go, obviously, the height is not an issue. The CB650R is about an inch shorter and maybe that's why I dared to ride the CBR650F with the same seat height in the sand dunes of the Thar Desert. The Trident 660 and the Interceptor 650 have the same seat height, but Kawi has them beat not only by 5mm lower seat but also because of a slightly narrower seat which makes it accessible to riders with a much shorter inseam. Even if the rider isn't short, the ability to flat foot a motorcycle improves your confidence in dealing with its weight. The Royal Enfield is the heaviest on paper, but I do not recall it feeling too heavy while cruising, changing direction or bringing it to a stop. You do feel the weight when you have to move it around or walk it into the garage almost like the CB650R even though it's about 11 kilos or 25 pounds lighter. The Yamaha, Triumph and Kawasaki are separated by a few kilos but I would reckon the Z650RS would feel the lightest because of its low profile and narrow body. I could dive deep into the suspension of these bikes but all I want to say is that for street use they're all fine. Don't get bogged down by people telling you the XSR suspension is substandard or get sketched out by the Royal Enfield twin shock that you may not have seen on modern motorcycles. They're all fine for street riding, and can even handle some rough patches of the road. If you like a particular bike in this comparison, don't let suspension be a factor that clouds your judgment. However, if touring is indeed something you foresee, the Yamaha XSR700 and the Royal Enfield INT650 as it's called in the US would take you the farthest before they run dry. The ranges are also based on internet research and seem reasonable to me based on my experience with similar configurations. And just like the suspension, the wheels and tires are more than capable on the XSR700, the Trident 660 and the Honda CB650R. However, there is a word of caution I would give you about the Kawasaki and the Royal Enfield based on my experience with the tires they are supposed to be coming with. The Dunlop Sportmax tires the Z650RS gets did not inspire a lot of confidence when I rode those on my CBR650F, but they were durable. The Interceptor 650 originally came with Pirelli Phantoms, but earlier this year, RE decided to switch them with C8 tires exclusively developed for Royal Enfield. On top of that, the tires are tube type, so a flat tire would switch your motion from freedom to frustration in no time. For peace of mind, a tubeless tire conversion is the first thing I would do to the RE. But that does make you realize that if being authentic to the record
Recruit theme was a criteria, the Royal Enfield wins this comparison because all the bikes are actually modern bikes that have been dressed up to look like old bikes. The Interceptor 650, truly an old bike that finally has just enough modern technology to be relevant and safe. Anti-lock braking system from Bosch is the only rider aid it gets. Steel braided lines are a surprise generosity that does result in just enough braking power the Interceptor 650 needs. The Honda, Kawasaki and Triumph have Nissan calipers in front and back, XSR 700 has Advix up front. None of the bikes have dodgy brakes, but on a Honda, you can feel the difference the radially mounted 4-piston Nissan calipers make. That is what good brakes feel like on a street bike. Trident 660 has steel braided lines, but that's not where they stop. Triumph pulled off a shockingly good value proposition with ABS, switchable traction control, rider modes, bi-directional quick shifter, multimedia connectivity, and tire pressure monitoring system. But one needs to realize that only ABS, traction control, and rider modes are included in the price tag they keep enticing you with. The CB650R also has ABS and switchable traction control and an optional quick shifter for upshifts. In fact, all bikes get an assist slipper clutch for the 6-speed manual transmissions except the XSR700 which has a standard clutch. And this is where we come to the part where the head gets in the way of what the heart tells you to do price. The Triumph Trident 660 has given some serious competition to Honda and Yamaha in the US, Canada, India and Australia but rumors arrive that they may be up for a price revision so I wouldn't be surprised if they pull off an Uber by first creating hype and hooking customers with an attractive pricing and then quietly increasing once they gain traction. So if Trident 660 is on your mind, act now. Royal Enfield is still the cheapest in the class across the world and comes with a 3-year standard warranty. The Z650 RS interestingly is priced higher than the Yamaha XSR700 in the US and Canada but they haven't confirmed their prices for the Australian market yet. Honda was already struggling to compete on price with the Trident 660 and now the Z650 RS price tag had made it worse. But here's my take on criticism for price of any motorcycle. Ask yourself, how much money is your happiness worth? When I fell in love with a Bajaj Pulsar 150 in 2006, I couldn't afford it. I saved up for two years to buy my first motorcycle on November 28, 2008. But rolling out of the dealership on my dream bike at the time was totally worth it. So give yourself the permission to be happy and do what it takes to get that motorcycle you've been watching videos about. And if you give yourself the permission to light up some more dollar bills and enjoy the warmth of a premium mid-segment retro, the Ducati Scrambler Icon, the Triumph Street Twin and the Bonneville T100 also make similar power figures as the other five, but the engines are slightly bigger and the bikes are a little more expensive. The Street Twin and Bonneville T100 are a little too heavy for my liking, but the Ducati Scramblers are pure love for no practical reason. The 803cc L-Twin Desmo engine is found in jaw-dropping avatars like the Icon, the Urban Motard and the desert sled. All retro takes on street, supermoto and adventure. Oh and the exhaust note, well you know what to do. Regret is not worth the pennies you will save. So listen to your heart, take the plunge and never look back. Drop me a comment if you love talking motorcycles with random strangers. This is for us in love with motorcycles since the day I was born.